Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Patty Brennan Show. Whether you have $20 or $20 million, this show is for those of you who want to protect, grow, and use your assets to live your very best lives. Joining me today is Brad Everett. Brad is our Chief Investment Officer, and we thought we would kick off the year with a discussion about the economy and markets, etc. And I can't think of a better person to volley with than Brad Everett. So, Brad, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Patty. Uh, so, you just recently gave a talk at the our local Chester County Economic Development Council, and I saw your slides from the event and was unable to attend myself. I heard great things about it, so I thought I'd pick your brain about some of the things I, I saw here and had some questions it. about. My pleasure. Absolutely. So, you know, this is an annual event that I do, and it really helps to kind of frame the year for me. It, it, it's an opportunity to say, okay, what happened last year? And what do we think is going to happen this year? Understanding that nobody really knows, uh, but it's a great opportunity to pull some of the data together and give it meaning, make it relatable, and help people to understand what might be going on in the world around us. Um, it's something that I've done for 17 years in a row. Wow. Uh, they keep on asking me to come back, and it gets bigger and bigger every year. So Great opportunity to learn here. Um, so I, I guess... Let's start at the beginning, right? You can't get into, uh, you can't even get to 9:30 in the morning without talking about COVID. So let's, uh, we'll start there and get it out of the way. Um, where are we? Are we making any progress? You know, it's a really good question. The answer is yes. Um, many, if not most, industries are back. Uh, they f they're figuring it out, whether it be this work from home thing or, um, you know, back in the office. There are some industries that are still negatively affected. They're still not back. Travel being one, although there's been blips of really high activity, and unfortunately, there's been some air, you know, air airplane delays and things of that nature and cancellations, it's really put a, a, a you know, a, a damper on things. Um, restaurants are still not back. Uh, that also has a little bit to do with the, the uh, supply chain and getting the food and getting things kind of back to where they were. So yes, we are coming back uh, from COVID. The economy is roaring ahead. Um, GDP is doing fantastically, so that's a good thing. So, you know, generally speaking, yes, we are we are coming back. It sure does show the the, the resilience of the U.S. Co economy. It's what it's what all of the economists talk about. You know, specifically when we think about how resilient this economy is. I mean, let's take a look. You know, unemployment was skyrocketing last year. It came down to nine, three point nine percent. Yes, the federal debt is way, way up. But what you're not hearing about is that the annual deficit was actually down. So, you know, there are some really bright spots in the economy, and 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 many Americans are actually doing much better. Um, so, again, it's not even. It's going to take some time, but we definitely are recovering. So on another note, humans have an incredible ability to adjust, right, to completely abnormal situations. They get used to them and make them seem normal. So on a business level, how have businesses adapted in, to this new seeming reality that, that's been around for the last couple of years? Yeah, it's been amazing to really think, whether it be a Fortune 500 company or a small business like ours, how how companies and business leaders have adapted. I think that's that to me is the theme. We have adapted. You know, even for us, we are a small business. When we couldn't come into the office, okay, we got to do plan B. Everybody grab your laptops. We're working from home. And was it perfect? No. Um, we had to get a better phone system. It was a, it was clunky. Our VPN was slow. So we had to get a new VPN. We got it and it worked out perfectly. So the job got done and people were feeling better about what was going on. I think, you know, I think that that is the most important thing with any dynamic economic engine such as the U.S. economy. You just have to, it's, you just kind of have to go ebb and flow, understand. And that's really what business leaders are you know, are, are supposed to be doing, whether it be, you know, employment and this great attrition that everybody is talking about. Um, yeah, there are a lot of people who are quitting their jobs. But, you know, to be honest with you, if you look at the statistics, people quit their jobs all the time. Right. And 
by the way, what are they doing? Well, it's not all bad news. Guess what? A lot of them are retiring because they can. Because guess what? The wealth effect, they've been smarter with their money. They've achieved that financial independence and they can. Or they might be working part time. Or what is really interesting to me is a record number of people in America are starting their own businesses. Now, here we are, the United States of America built on small businesses, and last year we had a record number of Americans starting their own. I think that's pretty good news. Now, we're not hearing it on 60 Minutes. On 60 Minutes, they spend almost an entire show talking about the number of people quitting their jobs. And yes, I'm just going to kind of go off on a tangent here. It is important. I think that we have a great opportunity in America, whether you're big business, mid-sized, small, instead of calling it the great attrition, how about we call it the great attraction, right? I mean, let's face it, people leave companies, they don't leave families. Create an environment that people don't want to leave. I mean, I don't know, Brad, what do you think about that idea? You like the ping pong table? Yeah, I would have quit a long time ago if, it, if you didn't put a ping pong table back there, so... <laughs> You know, there you go, guys. Okay. Whatever it takes. If it's ping pong, so be it. That's all and it took. Yeah. You good. know what? It's a blast. We literally will go into the ping pong area and I'll see Brad and they do teams. And it's bizarre. These I have never seen ping pong played the way you guys play it. They are so far away from that that table and they're winging this thing. It's 15 minutes. They all go back to their, their um, workstations and they're refreshed. So, yeah, a little refreshed, a little sweaty, and yeah, you know, and good. feeling really good because right. you are the champion. Always. always, 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 absolutely. So, you know, it's little things that can make a big difference. It's understanding, at least I can speak for myself. You know, we've had many families this year who have struggled with COVID, right? They've got young children. Uh, we have a young family right now, they've all got COVID, right? I do not want them thinking about key financial one iota. I don't want him checking his computer, even though he can't seem to keep away from it. You know, this is this is life. And we, we need to just adjust and be there for each other. I think that's the most, you know, for me, at least, one of the things that I'm most proud of is the fact that, you know, each one of you are the reason your colleagues love coming to work. I mean, it's almost ridiculous how much fun we have. Now, it doesn't mean we're wasting a lot of time. It's those quick little, you know, things. But everybody knows that somebody's got their back, and most importantly, that I've got their back. Right. And that's that's all people really want. So I think my point here is we're hearing about the economic impact, which is the, 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 the title of this show, the economic impact of things that are happening as a result of COVID or whatever might be happening. And we do have an amazing ability to adapt, to be resilient, to make different decisions. And I think everybody's going to be better off because of it. Right. You know, I think we create narratives around statistics. So to say that there's 3.9 percent unemployment um, doesn't really describe it very well. I think it's, you know, it's all of us by ourselves and our families making decisions about what's best for us. And if we're one of the families that doesn't have a job or if you're one of the families that is fully employed, your your life is totally different. Neither of those families are 4 percent unemployed. Right. That's a really good point. And I think that, again, for some of those families, that was their choice. They they chose to do that. They're getting, getting unemployment, uh, et cetera. And I think, you know, one of the other statistics that I think is interesting is consumer sentiment, right? Right. So here we are. And f f by all these wonderful statistics, these other measures, wages are up. Housing prices were up 19.1 percent. You know, the economy, GDP is really you know, chugging along beautifully, much better than in any period of time. Well, certainly in the last 10 to 15 years, right? So so everything is doing fantastic. Jamie Dimon predicted, uh, he's from J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon predicted that this is going to be the best economy since 1950, right? So from an economic perspective, we're doing fantastic, and yet consumer sentiment is really low. I think last year it was at 70. Like, that's really low. So normally they should be positively correlated, right? If you feel, if you don't feel great about your finances, you're not going to go buy an extra fishing rod. 
Right. Well, that's exactly right. Retail sales are going through the roof. And yet, they, with consumer sentiment so low, how if, if sentiment is so poor, but people are going and spending all that money, they normally, they, they more, normally wouldn't do that. It's bipolar. The yeah. people, you know, the economy is bipolar right now. Is it because they're not spending somewhere else? They're not spending on travel and services and all those things? Absolutely. And I do think that it's a bit of retail therapy, yeah. right? You know, it just is, okay, we're not spending it here, so we're going to go and do these things. And that's not bad, by the way, because a lot of that money is going into home improvements. Right. We see that in the data as well. That's also contributing to the increase in value of real estate. Um, so it's all it's all kind of a domino effect. I think that we have to keep in mind that with any kind of a system as we have it, there's going to be some unintended consequences of actions, whether it be Federal Reserve or fiscal stimulus. And one of those things is inflation. Right. Right. How many times, how many, how many calls are we getting per day asking about what, what should we be doing about inflation and how should we be, you know, mo- adjusting the portfolio accordingly? Um, so I think it's more specifically, uh, the Wall Street Journal really did us a disservice when they said how wonderful I-bonds are. Oh. That's the call that we get about an article, I guess, that was referenced in the, uh, in the newspaper. So we do hear about it a lot. It gets a lot of time on the news. How do we know, you know, the base effect will start to wear away, right? You know, you started from this extremely low base of inflation a year and a half ago, and that's starting to wear off. So how do you know, what will we, what will we have to see to know if inflation is just going to be kind of a blip or if it's something that's going to be settling in for a long time. And and typically that is what the economists really worry about. That's why I that's why I think Jerome Powell came out and said he believed that tr- inflation was going to be transitory because there were a lot of supply chain issues. You know, things were just kind of knocked off the factory line if you will. Um, but I think that 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 the issue is going to be are we going to see wage inflation? Because that is stickier. You know, love you dearly, Brad, but, you know, that raise that I gave you last year, would it be okay if I kind of took it back? Yeah, you had kind of a bad day yesterday. We're yeah. going to cut your pay by 5%. Exactly. That's just not going to happen. So wage inflation is sticky. Right. Once it happens, it stays. And so between that and all of this negative press about the great attrition, you know, it's really interesting as a sidebar. You think about that, and restaurants are adapting, right? So instead of being open seven days a week, they're open five. Right. The, you know, they, they looked at their data and said, Geez, people don't really go out to dinner that much on Monday nights. It's not a busy night anyway. So, you know what? We'll just not even open. They save on utilities. They save on labor. They save on food costs that get thrown out, et cetera. So it's it's going to be very interesting to see what happens and how all of this ends up in the long run. But I think that, you know, the inflation issue is definitely there. Uh, it's running at about 7%. It's, it's certainly hot. There's no question about it. And inflation really really is bad. Long-term inflation, bad for an economy. And what what I think is important to always keep in mind is that we have been running this great experiment called the American economy now for mm, 100 years, 200 years, et cetera. If Professor Furman were in here, he'd be going back to Alexander Hamilton, you know, all that. But the fact of the matter is, is that every crisis that has occurred the federal government has responded and the Federal Reserve has responded and reacted. I mean, that's what they're there for. Sometimes it works, sometimes they're late, and they learn. And each time they learn, they understand the potential negative consequence. And going into this thing, everybody, I say everybody, people pretty much understood that with this fire hose from both entities, the likely impact or the likely you know, effect is going to be inflation. It's just a matter of when. Yeah. It's just a matter of when, right? You can't have this kind of money supply, you know, sloshing around, people buying, you know, uh, Bitcoin and, and art and finding other places to, to buy. I'm not saying that that's a bad use of your money. It just goes to show you that it's got to go somewhere, yeah. especially if you're going to earn one quarter of 1% in the bank. Right. So, you know, it's, it, it, inflation is happening. Inflation is only an issue if the Federal Reserve do, do, doesn't do anything about it. 
Right. Because they know what to do, and they're already doing it. Yeah. They're, you're seeing it in your mortgage rates, right? Your mortgage rates are floating up. The Federal Reserve hasn't done a darn thing. They have not increased interest rates as we record this on February 4th. Haven't done a thing. But interest rates are going way up. Right. Mortgage rates are going way up. That's what they want. Because when interest rates go up, it's a form of tightening. Okay, They're pulling some of that money back in. Banks are not lending. I don't know about you, Brad, but I just you know got a mortgage. And let me tell you, it was worse than giving birth to a baby, right? It was a painful process. Yeah. Banks are not lending money. So that's the kind of stuff that really makes an economy go on fire. Well, yeah, I thought that was one of the, um, you know, historically, I always thought that was a sign of inflation was when banks had excess capital to lend. If the money supply is high, their reserve ratios have, are feeding through, allowing them to feed through a different level of mm. money to the economy through loans and things like that. I think the money that is feeding through is coming indirectly from the federal government with all of the stimulus that occurred yeah. uh, through COVID. So I think it's happened that way. I'm, I'm not so sure the banks have been lending that much. Uh, it doesn't seem like it. And that's what I mean. It seems like the opposite of what you would expect. Right. Right. So... But even so, the Federal Reserve is pulling their money back, too. Right. So they have their open market operations. And that's kind of behind the scenes. It's not something that's right in our faces. They're not increasing interest rates. But they're doing a lot to pull some of the money back out of the economy to kind of the ideal scene would be what Greenspan was able to navigate, which was that soft landing in the 90s. Yeah. Um, typically, in this part of the cycle, inevitably, I, most of the time, you end up with a recession. Yeah. So is it going to happen this year? Probably not. Could it happen next year? Maybe. Yeah. Depends on how fast they go and how correct they are in the process. Typically, we've seen that, as with everything, markets overreact, Federal Reserve overreacts. I appreciate how hard it must be, though, because... You know, every meeting you hear Jerome Powell saying it's data dependent, it's data dependent because it's got to be. Yeah. They're not going to come out and everybody's predicting four now, maybe five increases this year. They're not going to come out and say we're going to do five because we could end up right back where we were in 2018. Yeah, I feel you, know, you almost feel bad. Like they go through so much effort to telegraph what they're going to say and the minutes are 80, 90 pages long, and you know we latch on to one sentence that he says, and he telegraphs it as best he can. Right. And you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that there's a lot going on. There's a lot um, to be aware of. Is it anything that I'm that that I think we should be overly concerned with? No. I do believe that it's going to be more volatile this year because of the uncertainty, and there's always uncertainty. Yeah. Always. It could be rising interest rates or what's going on with Russia or, um, you know, we've got the midterm elections coming up. And that's going to be, you know, with the rhetoric and all, look how bad things are yeah. from both parties. Right. And that makes people feel uncomfortable. Right. And, you know, they don't want to keep their money at risk. So volatility is going to spike, I yeah. believe, this year. It's already been a pretty wild January. It sure has. And you've seen it in the areas that have done so well over the last five years. The ones that are really getting hit are large cap growth, right? And that is, that's almost textbook, right? right? Because interest rates go up. That's the way those companies are valued. Interest rates are a big part of it in terms of the discount model. And, you know, some of the valuations might have gotten ahead of themselves. Right. So they're getting slammed. I think Facebook was down 26% yesterday because they weren't growing quite as much. Yeah. Right. Which is wild because they even hit the revenue number. But I think their, their eventual earnings were low because they were investing more into growth projects than people thought they would. So it wasn't even necessarily – I don't think that's necessarily bad news if you're a Facebook fan that they're doing that. Right. Because – and that's a really good point. Isn't that what these companies are supposed to be doing – investing in their futures. So they're investing in this thing, the metaverse, right? right. And, and other technologies. And it's going to take money. And that's what they're doing. Not so, it's, it's going to hurt their earnings today. But hopefully it's going to multiply many times five years from today. Right. Right. Yeah. So 
That's the that's and yet on the other side, the areas that have not done as well, dividend paying stocks and things of that nature, they're holding up quite nicely. Right. Thank you. These are the funds and these are the investments that people are like, well, do we really want to have this investment? It doesn't nearly it's not doing nearly as well as this guy. I'm, I'm not you know, I will tell you, I'll give it to you straight. I always do. Everything is down so far year to date, but boy, they're not down nearly as much. Right. So again, it builds in some resilience to the portfolio. Yeah. So in your uh, in your talk at the Development Council meeting, you mentioned uh, something called the wealth effect, which it's an idea that you know as your asset levels rise, you feel comfortable enough to spend more. And I think it seems to even apply when the asset that's growing or the appreciated asset that's led to your increased net worth is something that you can't spend anyway. You know, if your house appreciates in value, you know, you know, you don't sell off ten thousand dollar bits of your house. Wouldn't um, that be nice? You know, S- somebody's going to come up with an NFT for that. I swear they probably will. Yeah, sure. It's probably, yeah, they're probably, SEC's working on it as we speak. Right. Um, so how do you, you know, I guess maybe two questions there. You, you mentioned um, that everyone's getting richer, richer across all wealth percentiles, right? Um, why is that? Now, those those brackets don't tend to own the same things, right? Well, it is. It is. It's almost startling when you look at the number. So, you know, you've got the different you know, quartiles, right? The bottom 50% of Americans in terms of overall wealth had an increase in their wealth of 74%, okay? Whereas, you know, everybody got wealthier, the top 1%, I should say, grew by 29%. And this is all the source of this is the Federal Reserve. So every everybody in America got wealthier, whether they earned the money, saved the money, received the money from the Fed or what have you. From owning stocks or and real and from estate, appreciation, yeah. the whole bit. And and I think that that's great, but we have to keep perspective of who is America, right? Who is America? And we talk about the wealth effect and we talk about the differences and you know, the the top 1%, they're just getting wealthier and wealthier. But the bottom 50% is getting wealthier, but they're, they're starting from a smaller base. Right. So when you think about the overall wealth, you know, in, in terms of real numbers in the United States, Americans have $136 trillion worth of assets, $136 trillion. The bottom 50% owns 3.4 of it. So the bottom 50% of Americans own about 2.5% of the wealth. So they had an overall a nice bump, but come on, you know? It's, it's, it's really, we do have to get better at this. There's got to be a better system. I don't know what it is. It's one of the most difficult so- problems to solve. Right. You don't want to take it away from, you know, the top even 10% or even the top 50%. Um, it is an interesting issue. We're not going to solve it today. But I, I think that the takeaway from this is, Overall, we talk about standards of living and and the standard of living for Americans in general. It is really good. I got to tell you, we are the wealthiest country in the world, and not by a little. We're wealthier by a lot. So there's a statistic I shared at the Economic uh, Forum, and basically when you look at the wealth relative to GDP, household wealth relative to GDP, we've had a big spike. But literally, if you look at the graph over the last 50 years, the difference between the two, and if if you see this on the camera, it's just, it's gotten wider and wider and wider and wider. Like, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. Like, I'm not kidding. Americans have gotten wealthier and wealthier to the point where if you listen to Tom Lee from Fundstrat, fascinating guy. Anytime that you can listen to him, I'll tell you, he's really, really smart. And he said, it's gotten to the point where we almost don't need capitalism. And you think, what do you mean by that? Right. Think about what capitalism is. It's the ability to generate income. It's the ability to generate growth. Well, we have so much wealth right now in America already that we just save and invest that, and that creates the income 
that we all need to live on. Like we would just be the bankers to the world and we would just invest in businesses in other continents and, you know, exactly. sit around and relax by the pool. and Exactly what he said on that podcast, Brad. Oh, really? Wild <laughs> that you just said that. We could just be the bankers for the rest of the world. Yeah. Which is a really interesting thing. So there are, yes, there's a lot to worry about. There's a lot to feel good about, too. I sure. mean, there is it, there is a lot to be said for all of that. So if we go, you know, just to I, I generally kind of shy away from short term market recaps or the idea of making projections for the next year, um, I, because I think that average year is usually very far from average. Right. The, you know, the, the, the experience is not smooth. It's not anything like you would expect based on, well, the last 30 years this happened. Mm -hmm. It's. In a given year, it's not like that. Just a you know a few ideas to put that in perspective. So the the average, if you go back the last forty two years, the average intra year drawdown has been about fourteen percent. I mean, it's a pretty big swing. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, of those forty two years, seventy six percent were positive years in the S and P. So by the end of the year, you know you have this you know this peak to trough thing in the middle, but Oftentimes it recovers, and you more often than not you end up higher than where you started. So, um, the other thing, which I think is even wilder, if you go back to 1926, I think the S and P has averaged a hair over 10 percent a year. Um, the if you but if you look at the distribution of those rates, only six times has the annual rate of return been between eight and 12 percent. Right. So, so it's all over the map, yeah, right? Completely. And and what's even what's Equally as bizarre about that, the statistics is, yes, we have the average, but a third of the time, the market gave investors a return of over 20%. A third of the time. Yeah, it's not uncommon at all. Right. It's really not that uncommon. Far more uncommon are the losses. There were only six years since 1926 where you had a loss of more than 20%. Right. So it, we should expect it. As, as you know, and as I've shared before on previous podcasts, we go into every day of every year assuming that the next wicked bear market is happening today. Yeah. We're ready. We're prepared. I don't want anybody who is certainly on drawdown, who's receiving retirement income, I don't want them to be thinking about this stuff for at least three years and actually six before they even have to think about what's going on with the stock market. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, we could, so we could say the same thing every January, right? We could say, all right, to summarize last year, last year was pretty weird. And um, this year, we have no idea what's going to happen. And that would be an accurate statement. We can say it every year right, and right, right. off we go. In fact, you know, the last three years, when you think the average rate of return on the S&P 500 has been 26%. Okay, that's terrific. Now, does that mean it's got to go down? No, because markets are a momentum thing. It's, there's a lot of psychology in this, sure. right? So people look back. I literally had a phone call today with somebody who's got a lot of money, and they've had it in a bank account, and they just were worried. They were worried. They, were, they didn't want to invest. They didn't want to invest. Then they looked at what we take care of, and they're like, should we be adding this money now? We know we missed out on a lot, but, you know, should we be adding it? And I... I basically said to them what I'm saying to you. I don't know. You know, it could go, it could continue to go up and it could go down. But as long as you don't need this money for the next five years or so, well, sure, we can put, put it into a balanced approach, a balanced portfolio, and then we'll watch, monitor, rebalance, and do all the things that make sound decisions, sound portfolio management work right. over time. Right. So, you know, I'm not sure which is more important, uh, Jack's birthday or the uh, 25th anniversary of Alan Greenspan asking if the market had become irrationally exuberant. Um, it's not crazy to ask, has that happened again, right? Or, so how would you know if it did? How, what, did, what did he see at the time? How would you know if we're in the same period of irrational exuberance? Okay, so I'm going to tell you right now, it's Jack's birthday. It's far more important. But December 5th is, was a big day this year. Uh, I should say this year in 2021. And that was the 25th anniversary of Alan Greenspan's speech at a dinner where he asked a rhetorical question. Now, let me kind of set the scene. It's a dinner meeting. You've got the chairman of the Federal Reserve, but he just wasn't any chairman of the Federal Reserve. This guy was Oz. He was the most powerful person in the entire world. You talk about people just dropping everything to listen to what he was saying. 
It was Alan Greenspan. And he just asked the rhetorical question, has irrational exuberance seeped into the markets? Well, let me tell you something, and I'm dating myself. The next day, bam, the market fell, and everybody's freaking out. The market's overvalued. It's going to crash, et cetera. And those people who sold everything missed out on the next three and a half years where their investment would have more than doubled, more than doubled in three, in, in, in not even three and a half years. It was March 24th of 2000 when he should have been asking that question, right? <clears throat> so here we are in February of 2022, and we're hearing that again. Has the market gotten ahead of itself? Is it irrational exuberance all over again? And it could be. Um, it probably, I will tell you, based on the valuation measures, if you just look strictly at the math, some pockets of the market are overvalued, but not nearly as extreme as they got to the end of the 90s. Um, 1996 was kind of an interesting year because it had just come off of a great year. And he was just asking the question. So, Again, it's a lesson of be careful what you listen to, be careful what you read. Let's not make important financial decisions based on somebody's opinion. So that reminds me of uh, Ben Carlson um, did a funny uh, blog post about a guy named Bob. It's called the world's worst market timer. And so Bob got a job in he got out of college and got a job in 1970, and he was able to save two grand a year for his entire career, right? But he's a very nervous guy, um, had a hard time pulling the trigger and actually investing. He didn't dollar cost average into the market. He waited until the market seemed so exuberant. Everyone was so excited. That's when he decided to take all his cash out of the savings account and put it in the market. Well, the four times he did that in his career were the worst possible four times he could have done it. He did it in December of 72. August 87, December 99, October of 7, which, you know, it isn't going to play well in audio, but it's a 48%, a 34, 49, and a 52% drop. Immediately after Bob, this made-up worst market timer on earth, decided to take his cash out of the bank and put it in the market. So I'm curious, Brad, how much over that period of time had he invested of his own money? $184,000 okay. total. Mm -hmm. um, he retires in 2013 with $1.1 million. Okay. There you have it, right there. The worst timer, the worst time to invest. This guy did it not just once, not just twice. He did it four times and still ended up with, you know, I don't know how many times the money. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, people ask all the time, how do you manage risk? How do you, you know, how do you balance the portfolio so I don't lose? Here's the deal. I'm just going to give it to you straight. The most important risk management tool you have is time. It's time. So understand when you're going to need the money back, because that's what we do, right? People give us a dollar, and we hope, knock on wood, that we're going to give them more than a dollar back, right? And the most important thing is, when do you want it? Yeah. When are you going to want it, want it back? Because I want to know that because I want to make sure that it's going to be there or where we're going to pull that particular dollar from. Right. Yeah, I think uh, there's I've seen a cool chart like the you know, the idea of just getting the money invested, you know, if you think if you had a lump sum and you're fighting the decision about dollar cost averaging, you know, if you're going to invest for 40 years, after you're done the period of dollar cost averaging, you and the person that didn't dollar cost average have the exact same rate of return. You're fully exposed to the market once your dollar cost averaging period ends. So the only time that you've moderated the risk is just during that very short period at the beginning of this very long investment horizon, right? So it, let's say you decide to do it over a year. You know, I got, I just won the lottery. I don't know right. if I should invest today or every month for the next year. You're fully exposed once that last purchase is done. So all you've done is if the market goes up, you've decided to moderate the up. If it goes down, you've moderated it down. But after the period's over, you're fully invested anyway. What are you what at the end of that 40 years, what have you actually accomplished other than just in year one, you've put your rate of return in a narrow range? That is a really good point. I have never thought about it that way. That is a brilliant point. That's why all this if you look at the numbers, the data, the data would suggest you, if you have a lump sum of money, you'd Typically, historically speaking, which is never a guarantee, right. yada, 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 which it isn't, 
you would have been better off just investing it as a lump sum. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And I was surprised, and I am just qu quoting off the top of my head, the difference in rate of return was pretty significant. It was about a 2.4% difference benefit of the person who just plunked versus the, you know, in terms of average return. Better. Yeah, I think it depends, yeah, on how long the investment horizon is. You could make it mm -hmm. a little better or worse. Right, but, right, yeah. right, exactly. So, you know, again, it's it's with all of this, we're talking about what do we think about the economy? What do we think is going to happen with the economy and therefore the markets? They're, they're don't always, they don't always correlate, okay? We saw that with, we're seeing that with consumer uh, sentiment as well. Um and the most important thing is to understand your objectives and what's important to you about your money and when right. you're going to need it, right? It's all about the financial plan. It's about your taxes. It's about your family and what your wills and your trust and what you want for your family because that's why you're, you, you did this in the first place is for your own financial security and the people that, that you love. Right. So what else do we want to talk about, Brad? Uh, well, we could talk about, let's see, we, we hit stocks. We could talk about bonds. So what do we think about fixed income in general. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, usually historically the best predictor of bond returns is the yield in place when you originally make the purchase, right? That's, you know, that you, it's easy to calculate assuming the bond pays till maturity and doesn't default. That's what you can expect to get. So yields are not very exciting. CD rates aren't very exciting. So, you know, what's even the point? Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, in terms of building a portfolio that it's there for cash flow, right? I think it's a it's a very, very lucky investor that can live off the yield of a portfolio, whether from dividends or um, bond interest. I mean, you've just saved so much money relative to your annual expenses that you know you can that you can live on yield, and it's not very common, right? So the most most people, I think, we really have to think about total return, um, and I think that has a, a negative connotation sometimes with investors because they think they're you know quote unquote dipping into principal, right? It does come up. They say, well, if you're selling this, doesn't that mean I'm dipping into my principal? So go ahead. Yeah, well, I think, um, I, you know, I guess there's principal and then there's your original investment, right? If you start with $100,000 and it grows to a million and you sell $5,000, yes, technically you took out some of your principal, but you just took out some of the growth of your original investment, not, you know, you're not losing money from your original base. I think it can just be kind of a, you know, a segmentation in your brain where you have this money that you started with and you want it to grow um, and you want to take the yield off the top, but it's not usually always feasible. You know, I find that people tend not to remember their original investment. They just look at the value as of the end of last year or the last statement that they got. Well, if, you know, if it was worth pick a number, a million dollars in the last statement, and now it's worth 950, and now you're going to sell something, yeah. isn't that really bad? I'm going to say, yes, it is bad if yet that continues too long. It depends on how much you're selling. Something like that wouldn't be sustainable, but markets tend not to go down and stay down for, you know, 10 years. Right. At least they haven't, yeah. right? So can't guarantee it, but, you know, and, and by the way, I, I should probably preface that or probably add that there was that lost decade between 2000 and 2010, right, right? where the S&P actually didn't go up. It right. actually lost a little bit. However, it is not to say that people didn't earn a return. Right. That is the magic of diversification because the U.S. stock market didn't make any money. It doesn't mean that nothing made money. Right. And in fact, people did just fine, thank you. Um, With international stocks and Absolutely. Bonds. Other asset classes, bonds, real estate, things of that nature. And, you know, fortunately, we have, you know, wonderful ways of investing where you get instant diversification, whether it be mutual funds or ETFs. And the asset classes have just gotten better and better. Yeah. So we don't have to get too cute. Let's not get too cute. By doing crazy stuff like, you know, crypto and some of these, you know, NFTs that we're hearing about. And yes, people are making a lot of money in them. I would just be really careful if you have a question on that. We just did a podcast on cryptocurrency. Please listen to that podcast. We'll give you the pros and cons. It's kind of an interesting asset class. Right. I'm not going to lie. It's a very interesting asset class. Are we recommending it? Not yet, because I don't understand it. And there's there could be some pretty significant headwinds um, to that whole cryptocurrency market. Um, you know, 
you probably know this already, but just the sheer number of different kinds of crypto that are now on the market, it's alarming. You know, just seven years ago, there were 66 different types of cryptocurrency. Now, there's 17,000 different types of cryptocurrency. Wow. Like, we don't know what's going to be the big winner. The one that gets chosen for right to, as a currency or whatever. Exactly, it is. and then we've got the headwind of well, what if the what if the Federal Reserve decides to come up with a digital dollar? Well, okay, guess yeah. who's going to win? Right, it's going to be the Federal Reserve. So, you know, I would I fortunately we're in a position where I think there's another a lot of interesting ways that you don't have to be taking those making those speculative bets. Right. I think that the interesting thing to pull all this all of this together is to recognize that we are in a different environment. Um, it is costing more money to heat our homes, feed our families, etc. So inflation is certainly affecting many people right now, uh, especially people who are retired who use more services than goods. Right. So we want to kind of build that into our modeling process, the financial planning process, and recognize that and adjust portfolios accordingly. At least I will tell you that's what we are doing. Is it going to be a permanent adjustment? Who knows? That's why we always talk about this process being like GPS. We just, just like the U.S. economy, just like major businesses and small businesses like ours, we adapt. Right. That's how you survive. So for all of you who are listening to this, I thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, Brad. So glad that you enjoy the ping pong table. Go out and play <laughs> a game. You've earned it. Um, and most of all, thanks to all of you for tuning in today. It's, uh, it, it doesn't happen without you. Your feedback's been fantastic. If you have any questions, uh, that, that episode that I was referring to on cryptocurrencies came specifically because so many people wrote in and said, can you do an episode on crypto because I don't under understand it. And for those of you who are listening, you're not alone. So we did a podcast episode on that. So if there's something that you would like to learn about or have us comment on or speak about, let us know and we'll be happy to do so. And by the way, go to our website at keyfinancialinc.com. That's where you'll be able to let us know what you want to hear about and ask any questions that you want to ask. And in the meantime, thank you so much for tuning in today. Take care now. Bye-bye.